What is up, everybody? Welcome into this guest episode of Flippin' Bats, and we got a great one today. First baseman for the Angels, Jared Walsh, is joining me. Just an awesome, awesome dude. Pumped to have him on. Uh, last time I talked to Jared in person was at the All-Star Game in Denver a couple years ago in 2021. Going to talk about that experience. That was also Shohei Otani's first ever All-Star Game experience. They were there together. Uh, so I asked him what percentage of questions that he got at that All-Star Game were about Shohei. And it, his answer is hysterical. But going to talk all about that. Uh, his route to the big leagues as a 39th rounder out of Georgia, being drafted as a two-way guy. The odds for him to make it to the major leagues were astronomical. The odds for him to be an all-star, even higher, even absolutely crazy. Uh, also, he he's still in the process. He just came back from an injury, a, a kind of a, a freak injury that you don't hear about too often. Dealt with a lot of issues as a result of that and separately and uh, now he's back in the big leagues, but still becoming comfortable at the plate. We talk about that whole process, his rehab assignment down in the minor leagues and transitioning that up into the major leagues. And uh, of course, his favorite stadium and his least favorite stadium. Uh, this is a blast of a conversation. I love this guy and I think everybody will after, after hearing him talk. So without further ado, let's welcome in first baseman for the Los Angeles Angels, Jared Walsh. He swings and it's a high fly ball, deep center field, it is gone, home run, and a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. All right, and I am pumped to welcome him in now, Jared Walsh is joining me. Jared, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. Yeah, thank you for having me on, I appreciate it. Of course, my first question to you as just a human being is, how are you doing? How are you feeling right now? I'm doing all right. Uh, still grinding for sure. Um, you know, but I finally got some answers on some of the weird stuff that I was yeah. feeling and some of the neurological sensations. And uh, yeah, just now in the thick of it and uh, trying to grind through the season. You're the injury that you went through and have recovered from and went through all of this stuff, thoracic outlet syndrome. It, it wasn't a, it's not a normal injury per se. It's not something you normally hear about in baseball or players getting and you were diagnosed, I believe, last August and ended up getting surgery and then had a lot of neurological issues, as you mentioned, to go through. What was that process like for you? Finding out about the diagnosis, um, recovering, what, what was it like for you over the last almost year? Yeah, so uh, with the TOS, um, I think I might have had some of that from uh, when I had been pitching. I pitched a little bit in the big leagues in 2019. Um, felt some tightness in my neck and stuff like that kind of persisted over the years. And then, uh, yeah, eventually just was having nerve pain in my arm and they said they thought it was TOS. So I had to get surgery, kind of a bummer, but I got some great rehab. It feels a lot better now. So you end up, um, starting baseball activity after everything happened and the neurological stuff you mentioned, what was it like for you after so long, finally being able to start back up just baseball activities was it weird for you at first or were you right back at it yeah i was chomping at the bit to be completely honest with you um watch the playoffs never really miss the game love baseball so you know when i'm away from the game it's a tad bit depressing so i was uh pretty much day one was getting after it in the rehab and i uh, couldn't wait to pick up a bat again i i think i i saw you were were open about some of the after effects of insomnia, severe headaches, and just everyday tasks became difficult. At the at the process, when you were going through surgery and recovering, did anybody make you aware that that could be an after effect or that is something you could deal with? Or did that just end up happening without you knowing? Yeah, actually, to be completely honest, uh, the timeline is a tad confusing, but my um, other neurological symptoms popped up uh, after the 2021 season. So it wasn't directly gotcha. related to TOS. Yeah. Um, I've been to multiple different clinics. I've got all sorts of imaging done and, uh, they seem to think it might be COVID related. Wow. Um, not sure if I have a predisp predisposition to neurological issues or what, but, uh, yeah, it's been a grind. You know how it goes. If you yeah. don't sleep, everything else kind of falls by the wayside. 
So you finally end up being able to start baseball activity again, go on your rehab assignment in the minor leagues. And my question to you as a guy that when I, when we had an off day in the minor leagues, just one day, when you would come back that next day and you get in the box and see a hundred again for the first time, you can tell you took a day off. You almost had a year out of baseball, Jared, and you don't have a spring training. Obviously you go on a rehab assignment and play in <coughs> like seven games, 33 at bats. Did you feel like at the end of that I'm ready? Or was it just like a, I need to get up there as fast as I can to help the team as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest with you, um, I always kind of got to pull the reins back a little bit. It was probably a tad bit aggressive with it, but, um, you know, we got a great group of guys here, you know, getting to play with Mike, Shohei, C. Neto, guys like that, Blossom. Um, I just want to be a part of it. So, um, you know, I was down there for about a week and figured why not get back with the boys and see if I can make an impact. I'll, I'll never forget. It was one spring training. I was talking to Ian Kinsler about this and he said, I mean, after playing for so many years, he's like, I, I have it down. I know exactly how many at bats I need to feel great and to feel like I, I'm ready to go. And, and he said it was 70 at bats, which if you think about spring training, you're getting about 40, 50 at bats, meaning it's a couple weeks into the regular season before Ken's felt like he was a okay and ready to go. So you with, I think you got 33 at bats down in the minors and then come up obviously because you want to help the team. But it was, it's just always been interesting to me hearing Kensler say like, I need 70 ABs before my eyes are adjusted. My, my brain is there and, and ready to go. Yeah. I think he hit the nail on the head with that, especially me. I'm kind of unconventional on the way that I swing and the way that I move big leg kick. I'm really mobile. So sometimes it takes me even more than 70 ABs, but I'd say that's accurate. You know, the stuff in the big leagues is so good right now that you uh, really need your feet underneath you to be able to hit up here on a nightly basis. Well, we know you can hit, Jared, because I believe the last time I saw you in person was at the All-Star Game. In your first and, by the way, only full Major League Baseball season in your career to this point, you were an All-Star. Uh, which was just a really cool experience for me to be there. And uh, of course, I would assume for you to be there. But when you look back on those few days in Denver at your first All-Star Game experience, uh, what was your, what do you think about? Wild. Uh, my head was spinning for sure. Uh, to be with that group of guys, really special. I'll hold it with me forever. Uh, I got to meet like Peyton Manning, David Ortiz on the field during BP. <laughs> so on my phone, that picture will pop up every once in a while. <laughs> Kent Griffey Jr., um, you know, I hope to be in the game for a long time. And that was just super special. I mean, a lot of future hall of famers on the field that day. So the fact that I was with that group at that time was really exciting. Did you, I was, cause they do that like media row out there the day, I think it's the day of home run derby. And I was, I was walking up and down and I, one, it was hard to even get to talk to you until I finally did because so many people especially the Japanese media, wanted to talk to you about Shohei. So my yeah. question to you is, at Media Day, what percentage of questions would you say were about Shohei Otani and not oh, you? 85%. <laughs> I mean, it was like, I, you could make that for the majority of my career. Like one time, like, hey, Ken Rosenthal wants to ask you something. Can you come in early on Zoom? I'm like, sure, I come in. He's like, hey, I just got one question about Shohei. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Good thing I got to the field early today to answer that, but uh, no, it's a pleasure. You know, I get to play with him on a daily basis. He hit one of the most impressive home runs I've ever seen last night, oppo into the upper deck at Texas. So every day with Shohei, is, uh, it's a blast. He he blows me away. Uh, the rest of the team as well, we're pretty much in shock on a nightly basis. Is that the first aggressive bat flip you've seen out of Shohei? Oh, it's a question. pretty good one. There's been There's been a few. I think he hit one off Logan Gilbert last year. He caught a 97 mile an hour heater out front and hit it like 118. And I think he, I think he flipped it. <laughs> Has it ever? Because I I was worried about this when uh, when I went over to talk to you. Obviously, asked you a bunch of questions about yourself, and I was so uh, I really I was so pumped for you in that moment and and your story and your background, which I, I want to talk to you about that in a second. But just such a cool story to end up at the All Star Game. But I did end up asking you one question about Shohei. Did it end up at any point? You're at your first All Star Game. You're sitting there. Did you? 
Did you or do you ever get frustrated with as many questions as you were getting about Shohei? No, I mean, I think it kind of comes with the territory. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, when you get to play with a guy on a regular basis, you're around him all day, every day. People want to know about him. So even in my personal life in the offseason, people are always asking me, what's he like? You know, what's he into and stuff like that. <laughs> um, he's kind of taken on like a, a mythical yeah. character almost. We just look at him as another teammate. He's just another guy and a uh, great teammate, great person. The the team, as the Angels are a very good team this year on a good stretch, playing good baseball, obviously. And I, I don't want you to have to go down a, a, a tangent about what could happen with Shohei, but there's the obvious sentiment at the end of the year of what could happen. Does this team that's very talented put any internal pressure on yourself to like, we, we got to perform this year or else? Uh, in terms of Shohei, I don't think so. But in terms of fan base and things yeah. like that, I mean, you, you know, our fans deserve us to be back in the playoffs. They come out and support us, and it's been, you know, I think 14, 15 years now. Um, so I, I think that's something that we're all really aware of. And yeah. uh, I think we have a really deep roster this year. And um, who knows, maybe, you know, acquire a few pieces later on and make a run. But – um, I would say this is probably the deepest team that I've been yeah. on since I have made it to the big leagues with the Angels. I mentioned your story, Jared, and you went to Georgia. We have a mutual friend. I played with a guy named Kerr, Kerr Powell in the Tigers organization. You were teammates with him there. You were drafted in the 39th round out of Georgia and end up making it to the big leagues with just astronomical odds. I I, I don't even know what the – I was a 14th rounder and the odds of a 14th rounder of making it slim to none. The odds of a 39th rounder, especially now, because I don't think that round even exists anymore, are yeah. <laughs> are zero yeah. at this point. Yeah. For you to become an all-star, even crazier, man. So I, I want to ask you, for you, a late round draft pick out of Georgia, what was your draft day story like? And did you know it was coming? Um, so I was a two-way guy in college. And uh, I was like an upper 80s, low 90s, left-handed pitcher. And uh, I had a good relationship with the Tiger Scout. I had a good relationship with the Giant Scout. They had said, hey, we're going to take you in those uh, senior signs, 7th to 10th round. We're not going to give you much of a signing bonus, but we'll give you an opportunity. And those rounds went by. Nobody called. Uh, the next day, I'm waiting. It's the 20th round. Nobody calls. Uh 30, 30th round, nobody calls. And then the angel scout called me in the 35th round. I was actually at Camden Yards. My mom and I were going to watch the Orioles play the Red Sox. Yeah. And uh, I'm watching the draft tracker and the guy said, hey, I'm going to try to draft you, but I'm not sure if they're going to take you or not. So uh, phone lights up. I get like 50 texts. Everyone's like, congrats, congrats. And I was so mad. I was like almost in tears. Like it was very odd. I was, you know excited but i was pissed off i felt like i should have went higher uh so many mixed emotions and i have like tears in my eyes and i see doug glanville and i'm on the phone with my scout and i think doug glanville was working for sunday night baseball at that point and i went and shook his hand and he's looking at me he's like who is this guy this grown man crying on the phone <laughs> shaking my hand i'm sure he hasn't heard that story yet but um it was just one of those days that kind of stuck with me forever and it was uh, one of the greatest days of my life, but I also was kind of devastated too. I felt like I put together enough in college that I could have went before the 39th round, but uh, I'm still playing. So, you know, it, it, I made it to the major leagues. I get to play with two first ballot Hall of Famers on a daily basis. I'm winning as far as I'm concerned. Were you drafted as a pitcher or hitter or were you, at, were you drafted as a two-way guy? I was drafted as a, a hitter. Okay. And then when I was in low A, we needed somebody to come in and I came in, I was throwing like low nineties, probably like a 92 or so. Uh, and they were kind of like, Oh, wow. You have a better arm than we realized. So did a little bit of two way after that helped out in the big leagues, mop up duty in 2019. And then in 2020 in spring training, I had some arm troubles flare up. So they said, Hey, we're done with the two way. Just worry about hitting <laughs> Been a hitter ever since. What if you're getting off the bump these days, what are you hitting? 
I don't know, man. My arm feels pretty good after surgery. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell them that. The way I've been hitting, they'll probably turn me into a pitcher. Uh, dude, I, I when I went to see exactly what round it was uh, when before I was talking to you, I saw some of your stats. In co- you went to the Cape League, and I saw – I need you to clarify that. You hit like 455, but you only got like – 11 ABs in like 13 games. What was going on up there? Well, I'm, did you go to the Cape? Yeah, I yeah I was up there, but just for, for the year I ended up getting drafted. So I was up there for a brief amount of time. What team did you play for? Katuit. Yeah, so I played for Katuit. And Coach Roberts, I get there, he says, I don't believe in two-way guys. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he's like, you're a pitcher. I'm like, I guess I'm a pitcher. And then we're facing Falmouth in the playoffs, and he calls down, pinch hit, we need a pinch hit i didn't have cleats on i'm like eating a hot dog in the bullpen so i ran down there i had a few starts and i got some hits but i think that at that point i was really more of a pitching prospect than i was a hitting prospect so it's kind of like a charlie blackman situation i felt like i was okay at both but um you know as i got older they looked at me more as a hitter than they did a pitcher so that's what i didn't even look so you were pitching a good bit up there but you weren't i was a pitcher only yeah and then your at bats you did hit you got a hit in half of your at bats but they didn't give you more is what i'm gathering that is correct yeah <laughs> got it got it okay so you end up obviously a late round draft pick odds are astronomical so at what point for you jared did you believe that you truly had what it took to become a major league baseball player i know in triple a you tore the cover off the ball was it at that point was it earlier was it in college at what point did you believe it Uh, I think I really believed it in 2018. I went from high A to double A to triple A and uh, I did well in high A, moved up quick, uh, did well in double A, moved up quick. Then I got to triple A and you know how triple A is. You're facing a lot of uh, bullpen guys who go up and down. So you get a feel for what big league pitching's like. And I had some success and that's when it dawned on me. I'm like, all right, I might really be able to do this. Uh, Built a lot of confidence over that off season, came back in 2019, went to big league camp and then, Within about a month and a half, I had debuted. So uh, that was just such an exciting time for me to go three levels. Felt like I was yeah. in a tough spot in high A and end of the year in triple A. Was, it was a thrill. I ask everybody that comes on this question because it's the call that everyone literally dreams of. Every baseball player dreams of getting the call to the big leagues. It's the call that I love asking people about because – I was that call away and never got it. So I love the right. experience and the people's faces lighting up and some are funny, some are emotional. Your story, Jared, where were you when you got the call and what was that moment like for you? Yeah, I was in Reno. Uh, I've had a ton of success when I was in AAA playing in Reno. So I had a game, I think I hit a home run and a double. I was feeling really good. And I was just taking my time in the clubhouse and uh, the hitting coach walked around the corner, Brian Bettencourt, awesome guy. It's like, hey, come here. I got to talk to you real quick. Had a big smile on his face. And there was a bunch of staff members in there smiling. They're like, you're going up. So called my mom. Um, you know, we shared that moment. Really, really fun. Uh, my parents put so much into my career. So, you know, to be able to call my mom and let her know I had made it up was awesome. Do you have like a welcome to the big leagues moment that happened to you at some point quickly when you got up there? Hmm. Nothing off the top of my head. I'm sure if I would have prepared for the question, I might have, but um, no, just seeing Albert and seeing Mike and being oh, like, oh yeah, Albert. I'm on the same team as these guys. This is kind of weird, but uh, <laughs> nothing that like, it just, I felt a little out of place. Like I almost didn't, you know, deserve to be there if you will, but um, eventually that faded away and they just kind of turned into teammates. Dude, I can't imagine being in your, like what a team for you a late round draft pick to get called up to with Albert Pujols, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, and all of a sudden you're just like, I'm here guys. <laughs> like how cool yeah. was it for you? Like, as you mentioned, you, you kind of just are hit right in the face with it. Like, do I belong here? Is that something that went through your head? Like, do, do I really belong here? I think everybody, regardless of the accolades that you come with has to question that at some point. Uh, but for me, I'm kind of a baseball historian. So like you said, I'm playing with Albert, I'm playing with Mike, I'm playing with Shohei. And these are guys you're going to be reading about in the history books 50, 100 years from now. So 
Um, that's something I'm really going to carry with me just because I've studied the the greats of this game since the beginning. And, you know, the fact that I've had a relationship with some of these guys is uh, it's not lost on me. It's pretty cool. If I were to ask you from those three, one thing that comes to mind that you've learn from them, whether it be Albert playing the same position you do or Shohei being a left-handed hitter or Mike Trout being one of the greatest baseball players to ever touch a baseball field. Like what's something from one of them that'll stick with you forever? I'd say with all of them, it's just the consistency within the routine. Um, they're not jumping from one thing to another. They know what it takes to be good. They come in and do their work every day and trust in their work. It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, they have the talent, but they harness it. Uh, Shohei, he's kind of in uncharted territory with the pitching and the hitting, but, um, you know, he's got it down to a science. He's tracking exit velo and, you know, every bullpen, he's got edgertronic, that kind of stuff on it. So um, using the resources, but being consistent with the work every day is a must. What's the hearing you talk about his exit velo? I, I've seen him take BP, I think, twice at the World Baseball Classic. He was doing it. I think he was just doing it for the fans just to be out yeah, there for them. absolutely. So yeah. I, I know he doesn't normally in season take BP out there every day, but you've, you've obviously seen him more than anybody else. What is the most impressive thing you've seen him do in BP? Because I don't know if you've played in Miami yet. Have you, have you played in Miami? Yeah. Yeah. He hit a ball off, the, like above the little square. It, it has to be like 550 feet away. I've never seen anything like it. Nothing. What's the most impressive thing you've seen him do? It wasn't even in BP. He hit a ball in Seattle in 2021. I was on deck four, and it went to that highest deck that they have up there. Very few baseballs go up there. And there's always some fishy stuff that goes on with the stack cast. Oh, it went four. 43 it's yeah. like that baseball went 500 feet. <laughs> and so like seeing him it's like even last night like the ball he inside out the ball into yeah. the upper deck up <laughs> that doesn't even make i mean i i think it was a heater a hit a heater yeah, inside like off the plate and he hits it yeah. 460 feet oppo yeah. like that shouldn't happen that's not no. that shouldn't happen all right speaking of different baseball stadiums that you've played in couple fun questions for you first off your favorite baseball stadium excluding angel stadium so take it out your favorite baseball stadium to play in oh that's tough i would say probably wrigley but i've only played one game in wrigley and it was 2019 but um i was born in milwaukee and we used to go to games at wrigley field somewhat regularly when i was a kid so uh seeing that as a fan and then playing on that field was probably my number one did you grow up a Cubs fan or a Brewers fan? I grew up a New York Yankee fan. What? <laughs> yeah. Okay, how'd that happen? Uh, HBO had a series called When It Was a Game. It was just basically like baseball history documentaries. Yeah. And, and um, it was essentially Yankee propaganda from <laughs> the 20s <laughs> to the 70s, the end of the 70s. So that was kind of what I watched. So it kind of brainwashed me into being a Yankee fan. <laughs> Did you ever get to Yankee Stadium as a kid? I did. Old yeah, Yankee? We Old Yankee. Yes. Yeah. Old Yankee Stadium. We went in uh, probably like 06, yeah. 05, 06, uh, and then got to play in the new one. So that's been God, a that's cool, cool experience being at both. That's awesome, man. Do you have a least favorite that you visit or play in? I mean, the Oakland Coliseum. I think even Oakland Athletics that you would they, interview have to say the same. Everybody, thing. it's it's either it's either the Oakland Coliseum or somebody will be like O for forty in a stadium, and they're like, I hate yeah. this place. <laughs> yeah, and for me, I kill two birds with one stone. I think my <laughs> batting average there is one twenty, and I hate it. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, in your career so far, it could be professionally, it could be major league, minor league, or it could be in college. Hardest pitcher that you've had to face in your career, the toughest pitcher in your career. I think you already know the answer to this. You asked me this question two years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who I said? I asked you at the all-star game. Uh-huh. Did you say, was it Chris Sale? I haven't faced Chris Sale, but for me, Glass now is uh, yes one, one of the most uncomfortable. Yeah, what is it? The is it the curveball spin rate, like high spin? He's just he's 
releasing it right on top of you and you know the curveball spins he's got some of that natural cut on there so if you're not keeping it tight you better have brought four or five bats for that day <laughs> all right i got one more for you this is going to be the toughest question i have asked you all day okay world baseball classic lasted bat of the world baseball classic who are you rooting for shohei otani versus mike trout mm -hmm. at the plate that no chance I'm answering that. That's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. I was like on the edge of my seat, like, oh, but I was also going to be happy however it played out. What so. I will say, or what I will ask is, how how awesome was that for the game of baseball? You're a baseball historian. You love the game. Obviously, you love those two guys. You're close with them both. But even aside from it's one of the coolest moments in the history of players being on a baseball field for it all to end like that was truly incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, I get that people think baseball is boring, but like I know you feel the same way when somebody throws a pitch 100 miles an hour and somebody turns it around and hits it 500 feet. Like, I don't know what's more entertaining than that. So, you know, to have uh, power on power two of the greatest players of this generation finishing a, an exciting tournament. I mean, you know, it, they could not have scripted it any better. Would you play in it at some point? Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be really, really cool. Like Team USA this year was so stacked. <laughs> uh, it was just, that was murderer's row. So the fact you got to tip your cap to Japan, they have a bunch of great players to win that. Do you have the, the option of like, obviously you could, Play for Team USA if asked, would you be able to, would you qualify to play for any other team? My mom is like researching our ancestry up and down. She's <laughs> like, you can play for Team Great Britain, but I don't think I can. Like I, I'm like, it's USA or bust for me. Um, so I would gladly though, if I could play for like Great Britain or whatever, it's just a cool environment. You get to meet people that I probably haven't played against quite yet. So, um, yeah, if that opportunity arises, yeah, but I think Team USA is probably my only option. I think the uh, if you're ever interested, I think Team Italy is pretty lenient on things. I think it was like the first World <laughs> Baseball Classic. I think they like called up my brother and was like, "Hey, you're 25 percent. Like, want to play for Team Italy?" And this at the time, think, it was like, what's, think, "What's the World Baseball Classic?" So he didn't do it, but. Well, I don't think anyone in my lineage has even like vacationed in Italy. So I don't, I don't think I'll be able to do that. Uh, Jared, this is a blast, my friend. Thank you so much for hopping on. Uh, big fan of yours. I'm rooting for you, buddy. And uh, come back on whenever you're forever a friend of the pod. But I really appreciate it. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, love what you're doing. Keep it going, man. Thanks, buddy. All right. See ya. All right, I just wanted to thank again Jared Walsh for joining me. What a blast of a conversation. 85% of questions at the All-Star game were about Shohei. Come on, that's ridiculous. The guy is an All-Star as a 39th rounder out of college. The round doesn't even exist anymore. That's how crazy the odds were for him to make it. And, uh, you know, you root for the good guys in the game, and he's one of them. He's one of the good guys, and his story is really cool. And uh, I thought it was hysterical hearing him answer the question of who he was rooting for the last at bat of the World Baseball Classic. Of course, he didn't give an answer. But I, I truly believe that. I, I mean, who do you root for if you're in his position? But uh, really cool conversation. Great dude. I'm rooting for him, and I hope everybody is along the way. So thank you all for listening to this episode of Flippin' Bats. Make sure you subscribe anywhere you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, wherever. We're also on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and you can watch everything on YouTube at Flippin' Bats Pod for all of them. Thank you all for listening. Until next time, my friends, peace.